Uh, hello, my name is Stephen Hartman, and I'm the executive director of the Bridges Coalition in UNESCO's Management of Social Transformations Program. Uh, I'm delighted to be um, co-chairing the session with Marta Neskovic uh, and uh, co-moderating this. Uh, and this is a this is a, um, a Bridges WAS team up session, I guess you could say, uh, called "Learning with Not About the World: Anthropological Methods for a Resilient Future." Um, I want to sincerely thank the organizing committee of the Education for Human Security Conference, uh, our partners at the World Academy of Art and Science, um, for um, for inviting us to to partner with them on the on the conference and in this particular session. And I'm delighted to have this team up um, between WAS uh, anthropologists and Bridges anthropologists and environmental humanists in my case. So uh, this. Uh, uh, this session really is going to be looking at um, uh, how uh, learning with, not about the world, is is sort of at the root of anthropology, at anthropological methods and uh, and and approaches uh, to the to that to that field, uh, and as a core methodology uh, with a sort of relational context, uh, uh, whereby engaging par engage, uh, engaging parties that learn from uh, each other uh, to avoid doing social and environmental damage is sort of fundamental. This fits, I think, with the Bridges mission. And I'm gonna take just a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about Bridges now. Uh, Bridges uh, began, earliest in its earliest iteration I said it's pre-bridges iteration uh, in 2015 when UNESCO uh, led a project uh, with support from the government of Japan called broadening uh, the application of the sustainability science approach this project was intended to take a look at the burgeoning field of sustainability science uh, looking back to say the beginning of the millennium uh, when the field began to uh, take form under that name uh, and uh, uh, looking back at where it had come over the past 15 years and where it needed to go um, to better support sort of UNESCO member nations in their efforts to meet the obligations and the targets of the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement, which were then just being formalized in 2015. So over a period of a couple of years, there were workshops that took place internationally that uh, different experts from different regions around the world took part in, uh, assessing the state of sustainability science, and then also taking a look at what sustainability science might need to do, uh, evolving as it moved forward, to better meet those challenges for, uh, for member nations. And that resulted in a report called Guidelines on Sustainability Science in Research and Education, uh, that was a UNESCO uh, document that came out at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, which essentially um, uh, did a few things that I think that were very important. It put the, the humanities, the qualitative social sciences, the arts uh, on the map more, uh, visioning it as having more of a mainstream function within sustainability science moving forward than it had had up to that point. It also really importantly focused on the necessity of there being um, knowledge communities, indigenous and local knowledge communities that also really needed to be stakeholders in the field of a transdisciplinary co-produced sustainability science and education. Uh, so um, that was very, very important. And this document was intended to be something that UNESCO could take around to different um, uh, national commissions of UNESCO to spark a conversation in these national contexts for how the field of sustainability science could be better supported at the national level and how that support could translate into different ways of actualizing the, the scientific and educational communities to better support the needs of nations as they work to, to, to meet their obligations under Agenda 2030, under the Paris Agreement, and so forth. So uh, what then happened was a number of actors who had been part of that project came together and said, this is a wonderful approach that UNESCO has taken, but it's really only half the picture. Um, if we're going to have this 
set of conversations focused on how science policy and educational policy can better support um, the kind of knowledge communities and the actualization of knowledge in applied ways to meet sustainability challenges. We also need something that's going to help spur bottom-up efforts, as well as the kind of transsectoral and trans uh, uh, transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary uh, collaborations that would be necessary to bring the, the natural sciences uh, into better alignment uh, with integrated approaches from the social sciences, from the humanities, from the arts, and from non-academic knowledge communities as well. So this was the background um, under which Bridges then began. It wasn't called Bridges then, but a number of stakeholders came together over the next two years uh, with um, uh, during four workshops during 2019 and 2020 to vision how could we begin to build um, a new sort of capacity that would work together with existing, let's say, capacities like the Future Earth Program um, that could work together with established uh, uh, science councils like the International Science Council, like the, like the International Council for Philosophy and Human Sciences, like the World Academy of Art and Science, which was one of the stakeholders uh, in these discussions uh, that took place over these four workshops who were there at every stage along the way, uh, like the Club of Rome, uh, and like more regionally based um, programs and networks and and foundations uh, that could be working to be sort of sitting around the same table. One of the problems we felt in the past was that the knowledge communities weren't always necessarily attached to academic institutions. Uh, and we needed to be able to access greater uh, coalescence uh, and dialogue and collaboration between academic stakeholders and non-academic stakeholders, between um, the, the sectors of, 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 of innovation and science and education, and then other forms of uh, societal um, co-production that would be able to um, uh, be applied to sustainability challenges. So with that kind of background, Bridges formed as the, Sustainability Science Coalition, which was proposed to be um, uh, part of the Management of Social Transformations Program, MOST. MOST is the de facto Social and Human Sciences International Science Council managed by the UNESCO's uh, Social and Human Sciences sector, and the only one really wholly based within the Social and Human Sciences. Uh, so we came together and began with 40 some odd stakeholders who had been part of these four uh, sort of international workshops that visioned an approach that would be the blueprint for bridges and proposed um, a new coalition that could be working together with existing programs such as Future Earth and a wide range of actors internationally. And that was um, the Bridges Coalition. And, and the most program endorsed and approved our proposal. And as of 2021, uh, when they approved it, and when we had our first uh, General Assembly, um, Bridges has been in existence. And since then, we have come together by building a series of hubs. And we have one of the hubs represented in this, uh, two of the hubs represented in this in this session with uh, Lucia Tala from the University of Wales, Trinity St. David. And myself, my position as executive director is based at the uh, Global Futures Laboratory at Arizona State University. We have three other hubs, Club of Rome sponsors a hub, Princeton University and CUNY, the City University of New York together um, sponsor a hub and the University of Pretoria uh, sponsors a hub. And we will be having more hubs that are coming online in the years ahead. So this is what Bridges is. Bridges is about um, a coalescence of knowledge communities, um, which anthropology is a very, very important one. And we, what we're going to be talking about today, I think, is how the methods within anthropology help to meet the kind of vision of bridges. And through anthropological approaches, we can um, be achieving broadly what I think the World Academy of Art and Science is, is trying to do and what Bridges is trying to do, which is why I'm also so excited that WASP and, and Bridges have come together as new partners. 
So um, over then to um, our next speaker, who, Marta, I think you're taking over uh, the, <laughs> yes. the, the, the moderation from here. <laughs> over to you, and I'll, I'll let us move on. Thank you, Stephen, and hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you today for this session, bringing together representatives of UNESCO Bridges Initiative and WAS to explore the role of anthropology in educating and equipping future generations to address uncertainty and promote human security. I'm excited to learn from our speakers more about the creative pedagogies and methods of knowledge making of anthropology. Our first discussant is Lucia Tala, the director of UNESCO Bridges UK Hub, Lucy is a senior lecturer in anthropology at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David, and a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Lucy, what can anthropology offer in terms of educating new generations and equipping them with skills that allow them to be comfortable with addressing the uncertainty that the future brings? Thanks, Marta. Okay, so um, I'll try and answer that question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my section then, I mean, our sections are going to link together, I think, I hope. Um, so my section then is going to think about the skills that I think are necessary to navigate an unpredictable future, the unpredictable future that today's youth is almost guaranteed to face now. Um, and it proposes that learning anthropology, um, particularly anthropological method, helps one to become what someone called Conniff calls an uncertainty expert, um, someone able to negotiate uncertainty. So anthropology, uh, to do this, I'm going to have to establish what anthropology is and what it isn't first. So anthropology established as a name discipline only early in the 20th century. So for a discipline, it's young. And originally, it was the exclusive domain of men, particularly white men, and it was based on the fundamentally flawed and, well, frankly, racist notion that small scale societies, predominantly those in the global south, could be used as comparative examples to reveal humanity's evolutionary origins. Well, this pursuit with all of its underlying values and academic conventions was accompanied by a particular kind of mindset that sort of assumed scholars were qualified to just waltz into communities and collect information, which unsurprisingly earned anthropology the uncomfortable title, the child and handmaiden of colonialism in 1968. But thankfully, critical attention to the diversity of social life forced change. And today, anthropology's core concern is to draw out the socially held meanings that cohere groups, organizations, and communities together to find out what interacting sets of ideas are employed to hold those groups together. Something that Gitz described as making the informal logic of everyday life visible. So contrary to popular belief, it's not about documenting and recording differences, but should be thought of as a perspective that moves away from looking through one's own lens to recognizing the existence of the lens itself, to expose and decenter one's own tacit and unstated assumptions so as to apprehend those tacit and unstated assumptions of others. Or put another way, for the fish to notice the water it swims in. So Komarov suggests that this is possible through a process of critical estrangement, a state that's claimed produces diagnostic clarity because of its, that allows the hidden to become evident. So estrangement enables fresh perceptions fresh perceptions of what are considered to be established discourses, when what appears as a fact, as timeless, as true, becomes open to question. So again, to paraphrase Komarov, when one realizes what happens, what appears on the surface is the question. So anthropology therefore is the really profound exploration of the creation of facts, as much as artifacts of claims to truth, of morality, of accuracy, of variety, of possibility, of the intangible. It pulls back the veil to show how each of us sits within and upholds a broader system or a web of ideas. 
Yet the generalized notion of anthrop that anthropologists must travel to far flung places to map low tech ritual practices, to preserve or to advocate for small scale cultural groups, to collect something that is oddly called data, despite it typically being non numerical information, persists. So this is not the case. Anthropology is not about now and then, and it's certainly not about here and there. It's concerned with positionality of knowledge, the consequences with regards to developments, for example, of AI, of genetic modification, of ocean acidity, of war, of human rights, of urban planning, as much as with the Euro-American concept of indigeneity. But most importantly, anthropology critically unpacks contemporary life to propose contextual futures. Anthropology stimulates thinking about what we, the people, want our futures to be in our regions. And as a result, I don't introduce hunter-gatherer groups into my lectures for students to simply know about customs and traditions. I want them to grasp there is a variety of social approaches to daily life, to governance, to exchange, to social organization, to the family, and so on with a view to conjure up alternative modalities. That certain hunter-gatherer groups insist that food gathered must be shared tells you something about alternative economic possibilities. That another group knows the forest as a family member encourages apprehension of vastly different ontologies and relationships with the environment can be imagined anew. That groups persist without a leader and without war means it is possible. These are the threads that allow new futures to be woven into people's minds. But that isn't all that anthropology gives. Anthropology has a distinctive method which gives more, a praxis that provides a raft of soft skills that are required for these so-called uncertainty experts. Now in some quarters, anthropology's main method is called participant observation. It's also sometimes called deep hanging out. And in 10 minutes, I can't explain what deep hanging out means. But what I can say is that it aims to collaboratively examine social processes as they occur naturally. By removing the anthropologist from what they know and fully immersing them into the unknown, by putting the fish into new waters, the whole world is shaken up. One's whole world views are shaken up and you allow you are suddenly allowed to see another view with a kind of clarity from the inside. And that's perhaps why anthropologists call doing fieldwork a rite of passage, where the world is turned upside down, inside out, and when the turbulence of that experience allows one to see the world afresh. So I started claiming that anthropology uh, uh, produces uncertainty experts, people with the capabilities to cope with uncertainty. Now, as anthropology uses uncertainty within indeterminate spaces to strip away and to interrogate assumptions, I believe it teaches students to become able to negotiate uncertainty. And in doing so, uncertainty is reconfigured as a potentiality, as a place where we come to know and materialize alternatives. So uncertainty experts are defined as sense makers, storytellers who learn rather than know, curious ethical thinkers who make decisions whilst acknowledging personal bias. Anthropology, the methods that we use do something similar. They produce individuals able to recognize, go with and grasp learning opportunities on the hoof, to understand one's own biases, this is core to this, to understand privileges and histories and perspective, and to critically reflect on one's own position within the unknown, to produce, and from that, to produce trustworthy accounts that humanize reality and dissolve the misconceptions that arise from those abstractions that we tend to rely on. So to also to ensure ideology is not twisted in representation or interpretation. So to avoid ending on a negative note, let me just say we may not have confidence in the future, but we, we maybe we can foster the confidence to creatively engage with surprises. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Lucy. Um, I would really like, I would really wish that uh, students also in, in high school, secondary education and at college could hear you speak because I think that would motivate a lot uh, of young people to understand what anthropology is really about and how useful it can be. Um, thank you. Now we're on to uh, Vesna Vucinic, a WAS fellow and a professor of ethnology and anthropology at the University of Belgrade. Vesna is the past chair of the World Council of, of Anthropological Associations and the present chair of the Global Cultural Policies Task Force of the Council. Vesna, could you tell us about how creative pedagogies that integrate research and learning, such as those you use in your university courses, promote resilience and equip students with skills to address present insecurities and future uncertainties? And also we would like to hear some examples. And thank you, Marta, for actually suggesting this panel, putting us together. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I will actually tell a story of my um, simple experience, uh, but to me a valuable one, and I hope I can share it with you as such uh, from class. So uh, as a professor of ethnology and anthropology at the University of Belgrade, I had a um, well, in the past so far, many, many opportunities to experiment with, with my classes. In the beginning, it was all very normative, you know, and, and things. But then I decided that uh, for me and then uh, uh, consequently for my students, it would be much more fun to be more innovative, imaginative and to change the topics despite the, the officially set curricula. So I, I do that uh, every year or every two years. I, I uh, change the themes of our work and um, the themes of the courses that I teach, which are urban anthropology and uh, anthropology of China. But at this point, I will mention uh, how I deal uh, or how I dealt with, with futures and let's say these topics that we are interested in here, that is um, how, how I, I try to prepare my students for future and strengthen their resilience in the urban anthropology class uh, with a topic that I, I gave to it, uh, which is urban futures or, or the city in uh, 200 and, uh, 2100, in the year 2100. So I, uh, th the idea was that we all imagine how cities in the world uh, generally, uh, although many, many uh, students thought of our cities actually in Serbia or even more locally, but no matter how they will look in, in uh, 80 years, right? I, I did determine the, the year because when you say the city of the future, you can imagine that it's, um, you know, away for five years or 10 or 50 or 100 or 1000. So this would not be, I wanted it a little bit more specific. So uh, anyway, um, uh, the, what, what I used as a method and what I've been using um, previously with other topics is to conceptualize a research uh, class. So I, I combine research and teaching or learning. Uh, and I do that together with my students. These are the third year students undergraduate of undergraduate studies. And uh, so the, the, uh, the concept was the following. We uh, collect sources together. First of all, the media sources, uh, then the scientific articles and other studies. Then we, um, we, we define the most important topics that we, we um, found in the, in the sources, but also through our uh, thinking through, through these sources. And we found about 16 different topics that um, actually describe the everyday life in the future city, the, the segments of, of life in the future city. Uh, so among them were, of course, um, uh, the ways of managing the politics and management of cities, the urban planning, architecture and interior design, uh, education and employment, um, daily schedules and work schedules, and also division of work within the house or in the family. Um, and then care about the young, the elderly, and the sick within the family or otherwise. Um, attitude to religion, 
social life, entertainment, sports, uh, and public and uh, family celebrations. These were all the topics that we considered in, uh, in, in our discussions, but then also in the making of a questionnaire that uh, the students were supposed to implement in their own families. So each student, there were about 35 of them in the class, uh, was supposed to implement the, the, well, the survey, the questionnaire through interviews, through direct interviews with uh, uh, their three generational family, uh, including themselves. So they were supposed to be, each student, a part of the, I mean, an interviewee uh, to himself or to, to herself, but then also to interview other members of the family. If some of the members in these uh, three generations were missing, uh, they were supposed to find them among friends or family, other extended family or, or neighbors and so on. And um, so basically they were, they were producing transcripts uh, uh, according to a standardized questionnaire that we all made together and to, to submit these transcripts to me for, for reading, uh, of course, uh, and, uh, and then to, uh, to write seminar papers. So basically, um, what, what we did was we, we encouraged or we stimulated or um, the, inter, the interpersonal communication uh, in a circle and on different levels, right? First in class with, uh, between the students and myself, uh, then between uh, them and their family, and then uh, between themselves. Because for example, when they were doing their transcripts and uh, so going through the, the, through, through the answers, they, they uh, shared it uh, between themselves informally. I found out about it only later on because of course I wasn't included in this conversation, but they, they most often uh, brought to the, uh, each other's attention the funny stories, you know, the, the, something they could all laugh at and or probably some strange ones. Uh, so, and then of course they, they brought all, all these stories to me back again through their uh, transcripts and seminar papers. So um, th this is a fun thing to do. And, and actually uh, it really um, made them, them and their interviewees, their family members think about this hard question because for many of them, it was, uh, it was very hard to give these answers. Uh, some of them were not even interested. Usually the older generation wasn't so interested because they said, oh, I will, I will not be alive by that time. So, you know, I don't want to think about it. But then they were encouraged. They had to ask, give answers because this was the homework of their family members, which was to be graded, of course, right? So they were inspired <laughs> to, to, to help them uh, do, their, do their homework. Um, and then, and of, of course, the youngest generation, this is the students of mine and their uh, siblings, were the most, uh, the most interested and their answers were the, uh, the most extensive and most, more inter most interesting. So uh, basically, uh, they, they had to go through, through this process of thinking about something that is frightening a little bit, maybe. Um, especially for some of them who had these dark visions of the future. For those who had more optimistic visions, it was, it was more fun. And actually, uh, you could, we could really discern these two categories in general of these um, um, attitudes towards the future, the dark and the light, or the, you know, the dark and the optimistic, uh, like, like the films are. And uh, actually, popular media uh, was very much influencing their, their visions of the future. This is, this is another um, thing that we concluded. So anyway, um, just to, to, to conclude this whole story uh, about this experience, um, it, it, it did, uh, I think it, it was valuable for them all who participated in this process to think about the future, no matter how they imagined it. And to share these thoughts and feelings about it and so on uh, with their family members, with their friends, with the colleagues and so on. So uh, to, uh, to conclude also with a practical, um, let's say suggestion, uh, I think that such approaches to coursework, to pedagogy could be extended uh, outside the university in this case. So that means to elementary schools, high schools, and even to uh, other courses for lifelong learning. Um, because uh, no matter that 
courses, such courses would not have to have such a title, you know, anthropology of this and that, or uh, anthropology of future. Uh, they could still be conceived in a similar way and on different topics, on different futures, on different aspects of the future, uh, more spe specific or more generalized. And uh, that would, I think, stimulate similar processes of uh, learning and sharing and imagining and strengthening uh, themselves uh, to, in, in expectation of, of the future. Okay, so this is it. <laughs> Thank you, <Thanks>. Bess. <laughs> Great. <laughs> It's always good to hear examples and 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 um, able to visualize the not just the theory of metagogical uh, uh, pedagogical practice, but also how it happens in the classroom. Um, now we are on to Fadwa El Gindi, a fellow and trustee of the World Academy of Art and Science. Fadwa is a retired professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, and the former distinguished professor at the Qatar University. Uh, Fadwa is also a member of the Scientific Council of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Levant Culture and Civilization. Fadwa, based on your experience of conducting fieldwork research and teaching anthropology, can you tell us more about the importance of the anthropological perspective in understanding the condition of being uncertain? How can the concept of human security benefit from anthropology and its method, methods of knowledge making? Thank you, Marta. I compliment uh, what my colleagues on this panel presented. Um, and in addition to building bridges, I think I will go to building blocks as well. I begin by stating that in order to align security goals with humans, the most effective path is to integrate the anthropological gaze with its perspective, which can be best achieved by immersing in people's lives. And I think uh, previous panels have addressed that. The gaze is reached by long training in methods. Um, it is remarkable how you can, uh, in a particular context or looking at a particular phenomenon, you can have a political scientist, an economist, a sociologist, an entrepreneur, a journalist, all looking at the same phenomenon. Then there's an anthropologist, and what the anthropologist describes is very different from these people. And I think that's what the gaze is about. It's a kind of depth and perspective that the others don't share. And the anthropologist, after all the training, um, is surprised that the other people don't see these dimensions. The perspective has two elements looking at humans in all their aspects, biological, prehistorical, cultural, linguistic, and social. And that's what we mean by a four-field anthropologist. And traditionally in the United States, the training was in four fields and the examinations were to uh, obtain a PhD were in the four fields. And this way we see the human in its totality. When we see some earthquake today, we say, well, this happened uh, 120 years ago in this particular place and the conditions were such. They are not necessarily related to activism and climate change. Uh, the other element is looking at any phenomena against the tapestry of the wealth of ethnographic information gathered over centuries. It's in books. It's in human relations area files. It is in the Smithsonian Institution and in the anthropologists' minds and tales and stories. And this is important that we should go back to all this ethnography that exists that tells us about how different people do different things and how much they share, how much they differ. Um, and this kind of knowledge that the anthropologists have been accumulating is invaluable for providing the perspective that I'm talking about. I have had the experience of immersing in the field. We talked about fieldwork, it's called fieldwork, in three cultural regions, in Nubia, among the Valley Zapotec of Oaxaca, Mexico, and among Gulf Arabians in Qatar. And my conclusions and generalizations benefit from this experience. 
Another experience of much value comes from teaching. I have been teaching over 30 years in the United States, and I've had a valuable experience teaching at Qatar University. Uh, I will share two cases briefly. I've shared it with some of the panelists before, um, because they tell us something about innovation and teaching and what education is about. As you know, Qatar prospered recently and very rapidly. And youth of today were born into wealth and very high tech. While teaching in Qatar, I realized that technology um, served as an impediment to learning. So whereas all of us are talking about human security and technology and innovation with technology, I say that this is a particular case that can teach us something. So I removed all high-tech tools in the classroom and asked students not to bring smartphones, watches, or laptops to class. And students were using chalk in their presentations. I have an, a, a funny story here where when I asked the dean to uh, remove the high tech that they had in the classroom and put a chalkboard. They said, we don't have chalkboard or chalk anywhere in Qatar. And I insisted, I said, if the prince can get his breakfast every morning from Paris, I think I can get chalk and chalkboard. And they did. So um, what I have seen since students were beginning to make presentations using chalk on is really phenomenal. It's a big change. Learning began with that moment. And not only learning, but I have observed students enjoying knowledge. Because these are students who don't need jobs. They already have jobs. They are very wealthy. They are very prosperous. They are already married. They already have children. And um, and they really don't need anything. And it's amazing that once they realized what knowledge is about, they were beginning to enjoy it. And they immersed and they engaged. Um, in the United States, I have another case in which there was, uh, in the late 70s, in the 80s, the onslaught of what I call postmodernist rhetoric onto the academic world, and students picked up that rhetoric devoid of meaning. So in my classes, and in the United States, the classes were very large, I put together a vocabulary of these words that the students keep using, and I never understand what they are trying to say. And I put it in the question, the essay question at the beginning, I said, the answer to uh, these questions cannot employ any of the following words. And I listed about 20 words that were always used by the students to sort of cover up ignorance. Um, what is amazing here is that students were beginning to fail their essay tests uh, and their exams because they really didn't understand what they were saying. They were stringing postmodernist vocabulary one word after the other without knowing what it means, nor did I understand what they are trying to say. And so learning stopped. I think these two cases are very important in telling us what education is about and what learning is about. Education involves teaching and learning. The teacher is very important. I know it is um, very um, to tell us what to do. We want ways of knowing. I don't believe that. I think the teacher is critical. And should the teacher be empowered by, of course, the knowledge of the subject matter they are teaching, as well as empowered by creativity to use innovation, innovation that 
emerges itself in particular situations, such as Qatar is a unique situation. Why should I employ what I employed in the United States? It won't work. Why should I ask questions uh, that I asked uh, uh, American students, uh, whereas there is a different cultural tradition, a different background, a different environment altogether, uh, uh, and um, economic situation, demographics, preparation, attitude to technology, and so on. So the instant innovation that emerged at the time to deal with the situation enhances learning. So innovation by the teacher is essential to learning, is how I conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fadla. Um, I'm having a little trouble with the chat. Stephen, would you mind reading the question? I cannot visualize it. Yeah, sure. Um, were, we've, we've had one question uh, in the chat window from Juliana, um, which is really two questions, but I'll start with the first part of that question, which is this. How can anthropology as a field and anthropologists as scholars and practitioners constructively confront uh, its colonizing roots and champion a better way forward. So that's can, I have, can I have a go? Am I allowed to talk? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Juliana, thank you so much for your questions. And they, they're a bit multi-layered, so there's quite a lot going on in there. Um, so I, I feel as if anthropology is already uh, trying to constructively confront its colonizing roots. Um, uh, of, obviously there's still work to be done but I think the key area is that anthropologists have recognized that they aren't learning about this is the title of this session other people but they are learning with they are being taught by their experiences with other people and it's those other people that become um sort of co- creators of the conclusions that they arrive at from being together so that levels the playing field it 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 brings the anthropologist into a very humble position something which scholars in the past didn't typically adopt they would you know assume that they were the experts when i go into the field i know that i'm not an expert of somebody else's life they are the expert of their lives and so I assume a humble position to learn from them and with them and be taught by them about what it means to be them and see the world through their perspective, through their eyes, through their experiences. Um, now, I think that's a very important difference educationally, pedagogically, and in terms of the kind of conclusions that we come to about what learning is at all. That's one thing. And, and, and that kind of deals with those colonizing roots in terms of going forward, in terms of a different way. Um, I think we've got quite a lot to apologize for, um, although a lot of other anthropologists would disagree with me on that. I think we do have quite a lot to apologize for. I can list a whole load of examples where I think we've made some terrible errors. Um, so, yeah, so uh, without sort of making that list, I feel as if the perspective of anthropology has changed. The methodology of anthropology has changed too because it's developed into um, acknowledging that whatever it is one comes to know is a relational um, uh, sort of situation. It comes from being with other people and them teaching you, right? To have I answered anything? I think I might have done. I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. Uh, Fadwa, you, mm -hmm. you raised your hand. Um, yes, I. Um, it is a very important uh, point that's been raised about uh, the relationship between anthropology and um, colonialism, because in fact, the anthropology has always been an instrument and still is. Um, so I don't agree with the good picture that we change. Yes, we individually change that. That is why there is no anthropology in the Middle East. There is sociology, but there is no anthropology because they associated with colonialism, 
and they say it's a fascist field and therefore it is not really being instituted or uh, built anywhere. I had to come to the States to get my uh, PhD and stayed. Um, but my answer to these is, well, you can still become an anthropologist and decolonize it, become a different anthropologist, do the opposite, get into anthropology and do real anthropology and be anti-colonial as well. So that's my orientation. On the other hand, you know, there is this defensive posture, but you get situations where I was at a meeting um, uh, by a, um, an outfit that's similar to the Academy of Word and Science, where they had um, heads of states and foreign ministers from um, particularly Europe, and of course NATO and the Secretary General were there. The minute I saw the guy, I got up and went straight to him and told him, why don't you just get out of Afghanistan? And the guy was so shocked. And he said, well, what will they do without us? And I said, they will do what they were doing for thousands of years and they built civilizations. Uh, you know, you should listen to anthropology. His answer silenced me. He said, we are listening to anthropology. You have no idea how many anthropologists of today from America in particular are embedded with our intelligence groups and guiding us to colonize Afghanistan. And I heard that about Iraq as well. The anthropologists were the front, in front of the army and the CIA entering Afghanistan advising how to control them through their cultural traditions. So I don't want to be naive about it. I think uh, these people are being exposed. Individuals can make their own decisions. Money is very attractive. Uh, CIA pays them a lot of money. But I think that uh, we can also continue with our attitude doing good work and countering these images and writing about them. Now we have several books out about these embedded uh, forces uh, by David Price and several others who exposed these moments, but they exist. We cannot romantically sit and say, let's gaze and perspective and anthropology is not about. It is. And we have individuals in anthropology today collaborating. And that's a fact. Thank you, Stephen. I, I could come with a, a thought while we're, uh, if, if she's going to be reposting a question in there, and that's that during the first session today, the opening session of the conference, I heard um, a number of really interesting comments about, among other things, uh, you know, um, the idea that today's threats can't be solved by traditional approaches to education. Um, I would, I would broadly agree with that. Um, uh, and among other things, I heard uh, comments uh, to the effect that top down efforts have to be complemented by bottom up effort. And I think that that's very consistent, I think, with the approach and the philosophy of WAS as well as of Bridges. Um, but I think it's also maybe um, worth pointing out that that's the messy bit. Um, the that if we if we don't begin to address how complex systems operate and how societies are organized in a variety of complex ways, um, we can't attempt to address those me messy bits. I would say, and and uh, I think part of rethinking traditional approaches, let's say, to education and traditional approaches to notions of security, really um, have to do with thinking about um, our own relation in this learning process. So rather than thinking only about education with a big E, uh, learning, you know, um, we do need, as I've also heard from a couple of different people in the first session, we, uh, uh, we need to ask the question, what do youth need to learn uh, to face the challenges of the decades ahead of us, the lives that they're going to be facing ahead of us? And that's a very important question, of course, but I think it has a complement, which is what do we need to learn and understand better about youth? and the potentialities that youth contain, including the potentials and indeed the, the knowledge and wisdom that, that, that they embody. 
uh, because um, uh, this is something I think where lifelong education can uh, is is very important as a complement to formal education, um, strengthening intergenerational intergenerational potentialities and and actualities for action. Um, where we can work together, not not as generations divided, boomers versus <laughs> whoever else, but 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 with one another, um, uh, and where we're not separated by mistrust or even a kind of arrogant disregard for the inherent value of all people at all different life stages. So these are just some thoughts that I had that came from that very first session that I think have complements or parallels with things that have been brought up in this session. Um, that lifelong education, for instance. Uh, uh, can be harnessed for the good of the many, the many people and peoples, the many sectors of society, and that has parallels with thinking in decolonial ways. I think about uh, the value of of peoples from all regions and all cultures as well. Thank you, Stephen. We have the, the Anne's questions. Uh, Anne's question: So, how can we reach out to more STEM students or institutions to participate, and more importantly, value anthropological approaches? So I, I think there's no kind of dealt with that a little bit in in her presentation when she said that this isn't that anthropological methods are kind of fieldwork projects that um, anthropology students are expected to do could be the kind of projects that other students are expected to do too. Too, it's not restricted to anthropology, and that in doing that, you uh, hone some of these softer skills that are necessary to be able to negotiate uncertainty. So when uncertainty strikes, you, you know how you respond and it doesn't sort of generate the kind of anxiety that, that stops you being able to deal with uncertainty. Sorry, go ahead. Yes, yes, uh, definitely. I think it would be uh, very nice if, if anthropology could be uh, chosen uh, by by uh, any student who uh, i mean uh, among them the students who study natural sciences and technology or whatever other other class i mean in uh, but it, it depends on the system the system educational systems are not the same so for example in the us where you have the major and minors you know and and then a um, requirement to take a number of subjects of classes in social sciences and humanities and on the other side in in uh, natural sciences this could work if they decide to have anthropology among among them <laughs> but uh, in some educational systems which are more uh, focused on a certain field or a discipline or, or yeah like like in Serbia uh, the students Mm, I'm, I'm not taking my school, uh, listen mainly to the classes in the field that they chose to study, like in anthropology or history of art or history. Now, they can also take some electives in uh, from neighboring departments, uh, but... Uh, but not, but but like we cannot, my, our students cannot take classes in natural sciences or in other schools. You see, so this is a problem actually. And I think in, in many uh, school systems, this is still the case. But anthropology could be seen as, as the most uh, general uh, humanistic and social science discipline, which integrates so many disciplines and yet transcends them and could be useful in these ways that we talked about um, for, for everyone. But it's just that uh, the decision makers need to realize that. <laughs> Uh, we have to finish the session soon, so I will just read a comment from uh, from Thomas. So, a comment from Professor Thomas Reuter. Uh, there is a recent book on the topic of anthropology and the Anthropocene by Christoph uh, Antweiler. Personally, I think we need anthropology to understand that our culture is not our destiny, that we have the chance to note alternatives and um, to choose. Um, sorry, yeah, and to choose the alternatives. Uh, Fadwa, just a quick uh, comment from you, and then we have to close because there's another session right after. I just unmute yourself. Fadwa. Yeah, I unmuted. The, um, there were some attempts by universities in the States and in Qatar, actually. They were concerned about students coming out of medical school and STEM programs and um, engineering who had no idea about humans and they were building bridges but they had no connection with the fact that humans use bridges and architects uh, were not really dealing with the people who will use those houses and so on 
And their solution was to introduce what's called core courses. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. So you have core courses and anthropology was always part of those core courses. That is uh, using uh, core courses and making it um, uh, required of these students to uh, attend the core courses the first year they join school. That's one approach. And it's remarkable when I was talking to students there they were they said we never knew what you just said that is the engineers were not i mean at, at some level they know there are humans out there but they didn't connect their bridges with humans until anthropologists told them you know bridges which are bridges different from stevens bridges but they are you know the real bridges but they have they are for humans to cross and uh, anthropology provided that perspective. So I think that it is important to include STEM and it's important for anthropology also uh, and to develop uh, critical minds by learning mathematics and uh, hard sciences. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> thank you, everyone. We have to close. It was, it's been a wonderful session and thank you to the audience uh for the um, for the enthusiastic participation in the chat and the activity so of course any feedback that you would like um to provide to the to the session participants or to the uh, or to us to the organizer feel free to do so and thank you everyone <laughs> again <laughs>